Gretchen Crosby Sims, the Executive Director here at the Institute of Politics. Thank you for joining us. We are so pleased to welcome Professor Harold Coe to campus for a conversation about his new book, The Trump Administration and International Law, uh, in conversation with an old friend, as you can see, Professor Strauss. Copies of that book are available for sale, and he will be doing a signing after the discussion. Um, upcoming events, I'd like to mention just a few. Next Tuesday, October 30th, Dr. Kim Wolski will be sitting down with Nathaniel Rich, who is the author of the, um, this summer's big New York Times Magazine feature, Losing Earth, The Decade We Almost Stopped Climate Change. On Halloween, David Axelrod will be interviewing uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin about her new book on presidential leadership. That conversation will happen over lunch, and it is um, UChicago students, faculty, and staff only. Next Thursday, uh, Caitlin Huey Burns will be talking with IOP fellows and former Congressman Tom Davis and Steve Israel uh, to give us a preview of the midterm elections one week out, which should be fascinating. You can find out more about these and other upcoming events at our website at politics.uchicago.edu. A quick word about those elections and voting. Um, we at the IOP believe that voting is the most fundamental responsibility and privilege that we have in our democracy. This fall, a group of students have launched a nonpartisan push to increase uh, turnout on campus called UShy Votes. So if you want to make sure you're registered, find out early voting locations, early voting dates in any state, um, or nearby polling places, you can check out the website at ushyvotes.com. You can also vote early on campus at Reynolds, um, October 31st through November 2nd, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of next week. And again, for more information, that's ushyvotes.com. We will have questions after the conversation. Um, during the conversation, if something pops into your mind, please make a note of it. Come up to the microphone that's going to be over here in this aisle here. Um, we, as usual, give priority for the first three questions to students. And we remind you that questions end in a question mark. Uh, please, <laughs> please make sure that your, so your phones are on silent, restrooms are downstairs. And here to formally introduce our speakers is Emma Solomine. Emma is a third year from Short Hills, New Jersey, studying political science and history. She has uh, been involved with the IOP on her time during campus as a fellows ambassador and as a fellows team lead here at the IOP. Please join me in welcoming Emma to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are honored to host Harold Hongju Ko, the Sterling Professor of International Law at Yale Law School, and David Strauss, the Gerald Ratner Distinguished Service Professor of Law at this university, and the Faculty Director of the Jenner and Block Supreme Court and Appellate <laughs> Clinic. Today, we will learn more about Professor Ko's new book, which describes the Trump administration's actions in several fields of international law, including immigration, human rights, climate change, and denuclearization. Professor Ko is one of the country's leading experts in public and private international law, national security law, and human rights. He first began teaching at Yale Law School in 1985 and served as its 15th dean from 2004 until 2009. Professor Ko has served as the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, and as the State Department Legal Advisor, for which he received the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award. Professor Ko has received 17 honorary degrees and more than 30 awards for his human rights work, including awards from Columbia Law School and the American Bar Association. Our moderator for this discussion is Professor Strauss. Before joining the law school faculty, also in 1985, he worked as an attorney advisor in the Office of Legal Counsel of the U.S. Department of Justice and was an assistant to the Solicitor General of the United States. He is an editor of the Supreme Court Review and has argued 19 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. In addition to thanking our wonderful guests, I would like to thank the IOP for creating such interesting programming throughout the year, and I would like to thank you all, please, for coming. Please welcome our guests, Harold Coe and David Strauss. Thank you very much, Emma, for that very nice introduction. Harold, welcome. Thank you for coming to see us. Thanks for joining us, David. Um, so when I read your book, I sort of found myself alternating between uh, despair and hope, um, because it seemed as if there were many things going on that are really very bad and troubling. But at the same time, you had ways out, or at least ways to mitigate the harm that was being done. 
So I guess, you know, we'll start at either the bottom or the top. What do you think is the worst or one of the worst things happening? And why should we nonetheless be a little bit optimistic? Yeah, I think the, the main theme of the book, I, I was asked to summarize the book in three words or less. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, um, he's not winning. Um, now, the thing is that people were surprised by this answer because um, every day you turn on the TV and there's a sort of uh, um, flood or flood of initiatives coming on and, and you feel as if uh, he's being overwhelmed. And so the question, the question is how do you pull back from that and try to figure out what, what is a meaningful outcome? And um, it reminded me of the famous fight between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman where you know, Foreman was this big, formidable, blustery guy. So Ali just sort of stepped back, uh, absorbed a fair amount of punishment, counterpunched when he could, and let the other guy wear himself out. And then finally, in the eighth round came and knocked him out. The net result of that was that um, in the seventh round, you would have said Foreman was winning. But in fact, it was uh, Ali who was about to prevail. Uh, I'm an optimistic person, but I think that we're coming to the end of this period of Trump's uh, relentless initiatives. Uh, there's all kinds of signs of frazzle. But what we're seeing from the other side, which is a little harder to detect, is a combination of resistance and resilience. What's the worst thing that's happened? Well, obviously, the confirmation of two Supreme Court justices uh, one of whom, um, Gorsuch, was based on a, a seat that was uh, essentially stolen. Uh, another one who was done without a thorough investigation um, and just sort of rammed through at the last minute. Uh, that could change the calculus over time, particularly, as you know, David, if combined with uh, a lot more lower court uh, appointments. But I think that what it's uh, done on the other side is to energize people. Um, everybody suddenly realizes that it's all of our responsibility. Um, he doesn't own this process. We all do. And so suddenly things that would have been fairly distant from uh, everyone's mind have become matters to march in the street and engage on all kinds of issues. So I think civic engagement is at uh, an ex unusual high at the moment, um, and particularly now a couple days before the election. Well, what sort of, I mean, especially given what you say about the courts, which is, of course, right and very troubling, what sort of avenues for resistance are left open? You know, at one point it looked as if maybe lawsuits would be successful, and as you say in the book, the lawsuits against the first two travel bans were successful. But as the courts increasingly become more amenable to, the, to, the, to what Trump is doing, what, are the, what avenues are still remain? Well, I haven't given up on the courts because, um, as you know better than I do, the, the Supreme Court doesn't hear that many cases. Even the travel ban case didn't get to the court finally until the third time around. Uh, all of the lower courts ruled against the travel ban. There are probably 50 rulings in all. Mm -hmm. uh, district judges actually are pretty skilled at not issuing appealable orders and can keep things away from the court. So the travel ban itself, <clears throat> all that was really held at this point is that they couldn't have a preliminary injunction, that it wasn't discriminatory on its face. But what's happening now in the lower courts is they're returning to argue, the plaintiffs, that it's discriminatory as applied, and suddenly evidence is coming in about how the travel ban is being applied. Meanwhile, in Europe, um, you can't fly from any of the travel ban countries to uh, the United States without transiting Europe. And suits are being brought there to challenge European government actions assisting in um, um, essentially administering a discriminatory ban. I think a, a good example of where um, the lower courts have stymied Trump is on the separation policy between parents and children. Because the original idea was gonna be that there would be a zero tolerance policy criminal activity would be charged to anyone crossing the border. What, what Trump doesn't seem to grasp is that you could cross the border without papers and be a refugee and have a legal entitlement to be here. 
but he treats everyone as criminals. And then the statement was made, you have to separate children from their families. I mean, that's just a, a moral choice of, of stunning callousness and cruelty. But what ended up happening was they got between two, caught between two federal judges. Um, and one of the federal judges ruled they couldn't do it. The other said in a standing order that you couldn't separate parents from their children for more than 20 days. And after a number of go-rounds, they've ended up back uh, exactly where they were before. People are admitted and wearing uh, ankle bracelets, except that thousands of families have now been, right. have now been um, divided. And now Trump has come up with another plan whereby they would hold people in detention with their families and then ask them, present them with the Hobson's choice, will you separate from your children or will you leave? And it will go before these district judges who I would guess would hold that that's a uh, unconstitutional, coerced choice. So we'll see. Right. I mean, you mentioned other countries, and your book talks about transnational litigation. I guess one thing about the late de later de latest developments that makes things even worse in a way, at one point it looked as if this, the Trump phenomenon was an American phenomenon, the product of a particular time in our history and the quirks of the Electoral College. But you see stuff going on in European countries that has some resemblance to it. You know, in, in Germany with the rise of the AFD and in Italy, the government now. Um, France seems to have held out, although things are a little bit shaky there. And of course, Brexit is an, sort of an example of the same kind of thing. I mean, is that, it, it, does this suggest this is a larger trend and that one of these options you see for mitigating the bad things that are being done here, will that also will start to slide away? Uh, well, um, there's certainly a possibility of a vicious circle. And um, you're right that it's getting bigger. I mean, one thing I try to do in the book is give a kind of global analysis. You know, what I think happened was, you know, there's a rise of global democracy. There's kind of a euphoria about it. But then there's a perception that it somehow froze wages. Um, marginalized and impoverished the middle class. They then started to blame immigrants for their problems and globalization and diversity and multiculturalism. Um, and then there was a rise of nationalism and authoritarianism. And it was combined with inaction on Syria, which led to this massive refugee outflow. So it became even more visible and easier to blame them. That was combined with um, the, the movement north from in, in Washington. And then suddenly you have a bunch of people say, make our nation great again, of whom Trump is only one. And you've mentioned others, you know, Duterte in the Philippines, um, Orban in Hungary, uh, in Poland. And these guys, all these global authoritarians, play by the exact same playbook. You know, they cow legislators, they attack judges, they call the media fake news. Uh, they appeal to populism and say they want to get rid of checks and balances. But I think the point is that they're ultimately they're presenting a false diagnosis, and that's what we ought to be responding to. You know, globalization can make the middle class better off. It just has to be properly managed, and we need to have a strategy for how to do that. That means working with our allies, not telling them to shut up. And it also means that um, aliens and immigrants can be part of the solution, not part of the problem. You know, I, I'm speaking in the place where Barack Obama uh, uh, taught and then became president. And you're telling me that, that uh, you know, all, all aliens are criminals, you know? Um, so what's happening now is the relationship between the US and the world is not zero sum, it's positive sum. And I think most fundamentally, Trump thinks about the world and the relationship with the world as deals, um, naked deals, which you can win or lose. And somehow he always thinks he's winning, even when he's losing. So for example, with North Korea, um, they've taken him to the cleaners, but he doesn't seem to have noticed this yet. You know, in fact, the relationship with the world is uh, relationships and keeping those relationships strong. And international law and domestic law have gotten deeply intertwined. Brexit is the clearest example of that. So when you, all you, your only move is to cut off 
these deals. It's like taking a tapestry and ripping out all the red threads. The whole thing comes unraveled. And um, you know, ideas that are being used by Trump, like a trade deficit, mean nothing. You know, this microphone was probably assembled in three different countries. With whom do we have a trade deficit? You know, globalization is part of our life. So he has no understanding of globalization. He thinks the whole thing is zero sum. Um, he thinks alliances are bad. But he's excited by the thought that uh, a tool he can use is to just break these deals. But then it turns out we need these deals, so he ends up kind of creeping back in and asking to be readmitted. You know, Trans-Pacific Partnership being uh, a very good example. Yeah, let me ask you about something that you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned domestic law and international law are intertwined and both provide opportunities to, the use of both provide opportunities to overcome some of these things. There is a, a, a vein, you know this of course, a vein of skepticism about international law among academics and maybe even further than that among journalists. International law is not really law. Uh, countries comply when they want to comply, otherwise they ignore it. Um, and now a big chunk of your, I hesitate to say anything, a big chunk of your career because your career has done so many great things. But one big piece of your career has been, I think, a living contradiction of that. Could you just explain that? What would you say to the skeptic who said, Oh, don't talk to me about international law. Domestic law, I get. You can go into court, you can sue, you can win. Uh, international law is just a bunch of people spouting platitudes that don't really influence anybody's behavior. Well, I can give a clear, you know, I met David um, in the 70s. Uh, we had both been in England. When we first went over to study there, you know, you carry your passport, and if you go across Europe, you had, you had to wait half an hour, 45 minutes, or an hour at each border just to get across. You know, we, we had to bring traveler's checks and go to the American Express line. You know, when we got there, we weren't sure our bags were going to show up. Um, I went two weeks ago, and you know, my bags are protected by the Warsaw Convention. Uh, when I arrive, uh, the Schengen process allows me to transit through any European country without change. I can go to an ATM machine, and because of the SWIFT protocols, I can withdraw money from my own bank uh, in New Haven. Um, instead of sending my mother a note, in 12 days, I'll be in Zurich. <laughs> you know, I can text and email to her and FaceTime with her from there, all because of international law protocols that are protecting new technological developments. So here's another way to put it. Our economy is globalized. Our communications are globalized. Culture is globalized. You know, people in Korea are watching um, uh, Britney Spears, or no, I take it back, Taylor yeah, Swift. I think that's Taylor Swift. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but guess what? You guys are all watching Psy. <laughs> Two million hits. Two million hits. Even our great sport of baseball is globalized. You know, I asked my son, why do you like the Red Sox? And he said, it's the only place in the world where six foot five blonde guys wear shirts that say Ortiz and Matsuzaka. <laughs> so our cuisine is globalized. Everything's globalized. And our law is an American law. Now, you know, what you're describing, you know, when Brett Kavanaugh was nominated, he goes to the White House and he says, I believe in the American rule of law. And in his testimony, I said, I believe in the American rule of law. I mean, could you imagine if a Chinese person on the International Court of Justice said, I'm going to decide this according to the Chinese rule of law? And how parochial can you get? I mean, in 1789, we have a Declaration of Independence, and we have a French Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man. It turns out the word egalite and liberté, you know, they're not American concepts. So when people say to me that the law can't be globalized, I say, um, well, why don't we go to the baseball park and we can have a little bit of uh, uh, Wiener Schnitzel, Frankfurter, and mm -hmm. Apfelkuchen <laughs> because you know, it's as American as Apfelkuchen, which also happens to be something imported. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So if you were giving advice to someone today who had the aspirations you had when you started out, really, to use the law as a means of advancing human rights in the United States and not just in the United States. Would you say follow the same path? Or what, what, 
what avenues are open now. You can, I mean, I sort of have the sense some are, there's some things that are more open for reasons you said, and some that are maybe closed down because of more recent developments, but maybe that's not, maybe that's not right. So if someone said, look, I, I want to do the things that you did to make the world a better place in the ways you did. I mean, I don't want to butter this guy up. I actually, we go back a long way, and I can abuse him very easily, um, but, <laughs> but I won't. Um, uh, if, if you wanted to sort of um, give advice to that person, what would you say? What, would the, what are the avenues that are open? Well, first, intellectually, um, we, we studied law in a kind of two-by-two two matrix, public, private, domestic, international. Mm -hmm and never the twain shall meet. Uh, in fact, everything is happening right at the intersection of this two by two matrix. You know, as, we, as everybody here knows, the matrix is a construct. <laughs> you know, it was imposed on reality. Um, almost everything that we now see is a hybrid of global and domestic. Um, so when we hear the concept of disappearances, is that domestic or international? You know, if you hear dot com, is that domestic or international? Um, and so I would say just focus on that intersection. Where I think it's most visible, obviously, is in cyberspace or in the internet. I mean, there's an interesting uh, irony, which is that you know, Trump meets with Kim Jong-un in Singapore, and he never mentions cyber war. Now, we all know that when that great global cultural event, the movie with James Franco and um, uh, Josh Rogan made fun of Kim Jong-un, they took down Sony's grid. The idea that we're more concerned about an, a nuclear missile being launched by ICBM from Pyongyang or a mountain near it, when the way that the North Koreans would respond and actually mess up uh, our system is to hack our grid. So the first words out of Trump's mouth should have been, do not touch our grid. Um, he didn't say that. In instead, he's, he said, let's move toward denuclearization. And you know, as David, as a lawyer, knows, I mean, I'm moving this toward him. <laughs> you know, they're not in breach. <laughs> I mean, I'll move it a little bit more. You know? uh, but but um, I find it comical that um, um, when I went to North Korea in 2000 with Albright. And the one rule we had was you never have the leader meet our president until the end of the line, after they've done all the things, after they've made all the concessions. Only then do they get the privilege, this little man, of having a photo opportunity with the president of the United States. Our president instead is now wandering around the UN General Assembly saying, where is he? I love him. I love him. Even though he has millions of people in labor camps. Um, let me mention working with um, <clears throat> Secretary of State Albright. So let me ask you a little bit about your time in the government. You were um, Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights on, when, on, in the Clinton administration. Secretary of State was Madeleine Albright, and then you were legal advisor to Hillary Clinton in the Obama administration. So were there things that, when you look back, you think <clears throat> those were things we did really well? We really got that right, and um, it stuck. And then at the other end of the spectrum, things where you think, you know, we screwed that up. I, I, wish, I wish we could do that one over. We made, the, we made the wrong choices. Well, I think the biggest screw up was Syria. Uh, I think that was an addressable issue in 2010, 2011. And um, we let the country implode and um, the refugees flowed out and it destabilized Europe, caused Brexit and arguably helped get Trump elected and help to, to pour fuel on the fire of this uh, global, um, anti-globalist movement you're, you're describing. Um, what I think we got right was what I would call an Obama-Clinton doctrine, Hillary Clinton, but also a Bill Clinton doctrine, which is a, a smart power approach. And they, they use the term smart power a lot. And what it means is that we have tools, um, one of which could be hard power. But the core of it is to mobilize diplomacy. And you know, Richard Holbrook, uh, who I worked with, used the threat of force to get people to the table to have them negotiate 
uh, the Dayton Accords, which has held for now 25 years. Right. They wouldn't have come to the table if they hadn't put that kind of thing together. So one of the chapters of my book is about how to end America's wars. We can't do that by beating them on the field. You know, we've been fighting in Afghanistan for 17 years. It has to be a negotiated outcome. But for that to happen, you have to put all of these different tools together in combination. And the key element is diplomacy. So another good dimension of this is, what, what is the alternative to the Iran nuclear deal? It's building a bomb and starting a war or working with the Israelis to do so. But the fact of the matter is that nobody wants to do that. And, and that's an a incredibly destabilizing option. The great irony about North Korea is that Trump started by threatening military force in North Korea willy-nilly. Tillerson proposed diplomacy, then got fired by a tweet. Then Trump got excited by meeting Kim Jong-un and now he wants a deal. And if he was to have a deal, it would look like the Iran nuclear deal, mm -hmm. which is the one he's just walked away from. So why would Kim Jong-un agree to a deal when the exact thing he, he would like to, to agree upon, Trump has just reneged? Mm -hmm. Trump would be lucky to get something as good as the Iran nuclear deal with Korea. And um, that's because Trump doesn't understand the, the idea of smart power, complex diplomacy, or the intersection of many tools or the role of um, diplomats in building these solutions. So for example, they demoralized all of the North Korea experts, many of them left, and now they're desperate for them to come back. Because after all, <laughs> when I went to North Korea in 2000, we met all these guys who were working on, they were all guys who were working on the North Korean side. When Trump landed in Singapore, I was looking on TV, they're all there. Those North Korean guys have been working the U.S. beat for the last 17 years. And meanwhile, we've had these wild swings of personnel. And the few people who actually know what they were doing, many of them left. Uh, fortunately, there's a couple people still there who, who have been around for the longer haul. And I, I think they're now getting more traction as it becomes clear that they're going to be needed if we're going to use a smart power solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what about that? Is is one of the ways out of this, or part of the part of one of the things we might be able to draw on is people who are still in the government, committed civil servants. They serve their administration and administration out, and are they in a position where they can actually get things done in the face of what's going on at the top? Well, they're bummed out. <laughs> I mean, you've read the anonymous op-ed. You know, <laughs> that's pretty extraordinary. You know, during the travel ban, there was a dissent channel cable that was signed by 1,000 people in one day. Um, but David and I worked in the government at the same time. We're in a period now where the people at the bottom who are just you know, one to five years in think, if I'm going to work in the government, why should I work for this administration? Yeah. And the people at the very top who have, you know, are at retirement age um, are deciding to retire early. It's the vast middle, you know, people who have 20 years in, who are sort of waiting to see whether, you know, the House goes back to the Democrat. Now, if, if there's a, um, if Trump is reelected, they'll probably leave, and then we have a real problem. But I think right now we're still in the window. A good example is everybody in the State Department was demoralized by Tillerson. Uh, remarkably, Tillerson seemed to believe that a measure of his success was how much he could cut the budget and staff of the State Department, which, you know, experts on bureaucratic politics don't understand why you would, you know, destroy your own power base. But that's what he did. Um, but now Pompeo, who I don't agree with on many substantive issues, is at least empowering, um, you know, people with expertise again. And that's starting to lead to various kinds of moderations of policy. You know, a good example is what Pompeo called um, uh, the invasion of Crimea, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, an occupation illegal, which is something that Trump had never done. Hmm. And you think that might have come from below? That might have come from the influence that his staff has on him? Oh, very much so. Um, 
So one of the great figures in the government, little known, is Song Kim, who is a fellow Korean-American. <laughs> he was the first Korean-American ambassador to uh, Seoul. He is now the ambassador to the Philippines. You know, he's from LA. He's a, a, a lawyer. He was a, a, a district, district, district attorney. He was responsible for all the efforts around the, uh, the decommissioning of the Yongbyon nuclear power plant. Um, it was interesting because when Trump was saying all the stuff about fire and fury, um, Tillerson was coming back from the ASEAN meeting in uh, Manila. And they had him on the plane, and they suddenly asked him. And he suddenly delivered the most coherent thoughts on Korea I had heard. And I was shocked for a second. Then I realized, no, he spent the last three days with Song Kim. Huh. <laughs> so people matter. People matter. All right. I think um, we're ready to go to questions. And here is the mic. And I will reiterate the ground rule that first three questions come from students. In my classroom experience, it always takes a couple of minutes, but there's always someone willing to ask the first question. In Harold's class, they ask questions all the time. <laughs> better teacher. <laughs> Laura, I'm a fourth year in the college who's interested in going to law school um, and perhaps doing something in international law. And I was wondering if you could talk about kind of the beginning uh, of your career path in international law and how you would recommend someone who is interested in exploring that future should pursue that. Um, you know, my father was an international lawyer and encouraged me to go that way. But I started out as a physics major. Uh, the problem was I wasn't any good in physics. Um, but if you're Asian and you're not good at science, you have to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> so I found it very oppressive after a while. But I finally switched. And um, when I went to law school, I wanted to do international law. But I actually didn't start until I graduated and was clerking. Um, we suddenly had a bunch of international law cases in the Court of Appeals where I was working, and I volunteered to do them. And it was very interesting, and I say this very advisedly. I, I, I went to these panels, and these old white guys were always on the panels. And they'd ask them questions, and they'd pontificate. And I think to myself, I could, I could never know what they know, you know. I'll never catch up with them. But then I started working on a particular matter that got into the news. And they had a panel on it. And I showed up, and the same guys were there. They were pontificating. And I realized that what they were saying was rubbish. They, they, <laughs> they didn't know anything about the case. And I suddenly realized, you know, when the world moves so fast, if you just pay attention, um, what you know will be more relevant. You know, what, what do I know about the internet? You know, I still talk about going on the internet. I mean, you live your life on the internet. Um, and so if you do international law and you just stay focused um, and keep following the latest things, what you know will be uh, the most relevant thing possible. And you know, even now, it's really almost impossible to, to uh, keep up. You know, my daughter was telling me, how, how can you not follow Twitter? And I, I, just, I, I just don't get it. And, <laughs> and uh, so she actually took my cell phone from me and set it up for Twitter. And now these things are pinging all the time. But it's very interesting. <laughs> I was missing a lot. <laughs> and then somebody else said, well, it's not Twitter. It's Instagram. Oh, my god. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Shri. I'm a fourth year in the college. I was wondering. Um, Looking forward to the next presidential election, even if Trump doesn't get reelected, what do you think the path forward is in terms of repairing international relationships with a lot of different countries if we've pulled out of a lot of treaties and deals and things like that? Thank you. Thank you. Well, two things. I have an article coming out in about two weeks um, that argues that the president doesn't have a general unilateral power to terminate treaties. 
there's a case that David knows well called Goldwater versus Carter, which said that if the president terminates a bilateral treaty, it's not reviewable. But the law of, of justiciability or ruling on the merits has changed, so it, it probably would be. So as you may have noticed, Trump has shifted to this device of terminating agreements. You know, in the last couple of weeks, he terminated the um, 1955 treaty with Iran, the uh, Vienna Convention, uh, optional protocol, he, you know, the Universal Postal Union Treaty. Now he's talking about terminating the INF Treaty. Uh, Trump likes to do things that he thinks he alone can do, like you know, pardon people or strip their security clearances. And one thing that became very clear to me looking at this stuff is academics have accepted the idea of a general unilateral power of the president to terminate bilateral, multilateral trees of all kinds, um, even though that's never been held by the court. I mean, does that mean that Donald Trump could, could um, take us out of the UN or NATO by tweet? In fact, you know, if you read um, the book by uh, uh, Bob Woodward, you know, that he describes that there are these three you know, letters terminating all these treaties, that, and they just grab them off of Trump's desk. It, it shouldn't rely on that. So you know, one piece of this is I do not think that this power is a unilateral power. You know, for example, the British uh, House of Lords, UK Supreme Court, ruled that parliament must be involved. I would argue instead that the level of legislative participation needed to enter should be mirrored by the what's needed to exit. But on the repair side, I think we just have to you know, keep our alliances strong. And one, one interesting thing in the, in the book I described, um, the default under Trump is what I'd call resigning without leaving. You know, he says we're gonna leave. He makes us lame ducks. But then we don't leave. You know, so we haven't left the Paris Climate Agreement yet. I mean, that, that won't, he won't even give the notice until November 2019. Then it won't be effective till a year later, which is after the election. So we're still in, except that the administration's not doing anything. So the Chinese are now the dominant figure in this discussion. But the good news is that this had happened before. You know, we left the UN Human Rights Council, and then under Obama, we came back in. And you know, I was in the delegation. When we came back in, they were standing up and applauding. You know, John Bolton just launched a huge attack on the International Criminal Court. So did Bush. But you know, it's easy for another administration to come in. You know, we, we didn't pay our UN dues for years. But if we repair the arrears, we can participate again. Now, is this good, this kind of pendulum swing? No. Does any other country? of our significance show that kind of um, wild variation? No. And finally, Congress has to step up. I mean, our, our congressional processes have broken down. We, we don't have the J. William Fulbright types who are really engaged on these kinds of issues. And Congress has um, surrendered power on issues like uh, war making. But you know, if the president's launching a trade war, that's in the heart of Congress's constitutional power. And Congress should use its you know, delegated powers over foreign commerce to regulate that. As they did, by the way, with regard to sanctions against Russia after the Salisbury nerve agent attack. Hi, my name's Angela Seeger. Um, I'm a third year in the college, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, my question is, given the recent uh, uh, confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh to the court, how do you think that will affect how the international community views Supreme Court uh, precedents from now on? Well, I think um, uh, Kavanaugh wrote a series of concurring opinions that were essentially job advertisements. And uh, some, of, some of them were huge attacks on international law. I mean, these, these were, they cited many articles. You know, they, they cited some of my articles. It was pretty clear to me that he didn't understand the point of the articles because the, the citations and discussion made no sense. 
But I think they will view our rulings as very parochial. I mean, we, we have a, a very anti-globalist court. Some of the justices, I don't know if they've ever traveled outside the United States. I mean, that's shocking. I, I would guess most University of Chicago freshmen have traveled outside the United States. And you know, they're no longer making law just for this country. You know, they're, they're affecting a global superpower. Now, when David and I were in law school, it was a Cold War era. And um, that kind of um, you know, parochial obsession with US law um, seemed appropriate. You know, very few of us took international law in law school for that reason. But things on that have radically changed. Now, on the other side, we have people like Steve Breyer, who's written a lot about uh, America and the world. You know, he speaks fluent French. He's married to a British woman. You know, Sonia Sotomayor, who obviously speaks you know, Spanish. Um, um, Ruth Ginsburg, who studied comparative law in Sweden. So there are people on the court who can present that other view. So, um, you know, Neil Gorsuch studied abroad, and we don't really know what his positions on these things are. So I think it remains to be seen. After a confirmation hearing like the one that Brett Kavanaugh just had, we, we, it's, it's really hard to know how he's going to respond. Um, and another thing which I think just has to be mentioned again is that uh, during the time when David was arguing at the court a lot, they were hearing, you know, um, I forget how many cases a year. 120, 130. 120, and now they hear, what, 60? Yeah. Um, so as a result, uh, you know, the, their capacity to, to, you know, I was just being asked about a book that had the leading Supreme Court cases on international law from 1998, uh, I'm sorry, 2008, 10 years ago. There have been surprisingly few major rulings since, and almost nothing on the internet, e-commerce, things like that. They just haven't caught up, and, and, and they don't really understand it. You know, on, on surveillance, uh, they wrote an opinion about somebody putting a GPS device on someone's car to track it. You know, every single person in this room has a GPS device, which they carry by themselves. So this, this is moving faster than the court is able to opine. And uh, what will end up being important is case selection. The Supreme Court picks its cases, and it could end up picking cases that aren't representative of the way that things are at large. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name's Kenneth Newman. I'm an alum, and I live in the neighborhood. Um, I do a lot of work internationally in sports, and I still have concerns about the president or members of Congress trying to interfere with US, the US Olympic team, World Cup, do you see, are people in the State Department doing that? Do you see any more concerns about the U.S. national teams of whatever sport being um, potentially, uh, you know, Trump trying to do an embargo or, or trying to uh, deny a, a foreign country coming here to play sports and for, any, for whatever sport? So the State Department focuses a great deal on what they call people-to-people -people oh, diplomacy. I'm aware, I'm aware of that of which sports diplomacy is maybe the best example. You know, remember uh, in the 70s, it was ping pong diplomacy that, that opened up China. Uh, I'll tell you one of the saddest uh, moments of my life. Um, in December 2000, I left Pyongyang with Albright, and we went to the South to see the president of South Korea, Kim Dae-jung, who Nobel Prize winner, and he says, I believe it's possible to have a, um, a federal government with the North and South of Korea that would be similar to the reunification of Germany. And I think one thing we should do is to have a unified Olympic team. But by the way, they did do that for the Pyeongchang Olympics. And then he said, in 2002, the World Cup soccer match is scheduled to be played in Tokyo. He said, we should play it in Pyongyang. And I, I remember flying home and I thought, I had two great dreams in my life. One of them was that Korea would be reunified in my lifetime. It, it, it might happen. The other dream I, was that the Red Sox would win the World Series. 
which well, I thought maybe, was maybe which I thought was impossible. I thought <laughs> I thought that's an impossible dream. <laughs> but um, anyway, I won't go on. Yes, please don't. We, we, we <laughs> but what, what ended up happening was um, George W. Bush broke off those talks, and the 2002 final of the World Cup was South Korea against a United Germany, and they played it in Tokyo. Hmm. They could have played it in Pyongyang with every television camera in the world there, and the North Koreans rooting for the South Koreans. I, th I think it would have blown the country if open. The South Koreans got third, it wasn't bad. <laughs> well, with the North Koreans, they probably could have gotten first. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. My name is Rodrigo Estrada. I'm a second year student at the college studying economics and human rights. And with regards to the liberal world order, how would you respond to criticisms preceding Trump by several IR scholars that it's primarily been a transatlantic agreement and that has not benefited the third world or specifically uh, skyrocketing inequality across uh, the global south, as well as its um, ability to ensure democracy in you know, several examples such as Libya, Yemen, and um, that, that, and even Iraq as well. And how would you also um, kind of correlate that or kind of consider that in light of Trump's criticisms? Are they completely baseless or do they warrant some consideration? Well, I mean, the, to say that the liberal world order or what, what I call in my book the Kantian system of global governance that's under attack obviously needed to be more inclusive and to address these democratic deficit issues. Uh, but it's easier to mend that system than to revert to kind of George Orwell spheres of influence, which is what I think Trump is trying to do. Uh, I would say that a missed opportunity was Arab Spring. You know, in, in 2010, you know, suddenly across the Middle East and North Africa, you know, we are having all these demonstrations and efforts to overthrow authoritarian governments. And Secretary Clinton we're watching this on TV and she said, you know what? Those people don't want to join Al-Qaeda. They want to have control of their own lives. Now, that requires the kind of investment that you saw in Central and Eastern Europe when authoritarian governments collapsed there, a huge initiative on rule of law and other things. That was exactly the kind of thing that did not happen. And now we see what's happened, which has been this consolidation of power in the Middle East. And then now we are doubling down on fossil fuels. And you know, at a moment when you could liberate the United States from the grip of these dictators in the Middle East who just happen to be sitting on pots of oil, you know, we are in a situation in which we're walking away from the viable alternative and then you know you end up having situations where our president is acting as if there was some sort of rogue event um, that led to the murder of a Washington Post columnist with two million followers on tweet in an accidental encounter in which one of twelve hitmen happened to come to the encounter with a bone saw. You know, <laughs> I mean that's that's where we're ending up now. And I do think there will be yet another run uh, at. Uh, arrow spring down the road. Um, and I think it's, we're going to have to do better. And the real question is making the kinds of investments that we've been unwilling to make collectively. And inclusion of the global south in these kinds of discussions. It means more multilateralism, not less multilateralism. My name is Mary Ellen O'Connell. I'm a professor of international law at Notre Dame uh, University, but I have the privilege to be a visiting professor this quarter at the University of Chicago Law School. And of course, Harold and I are old friends. We're also Marshall Scholars along with, uh, with David Strauss, and it's a privilege to be here. And I must say, Harold, I congratulate you and I thank you for this work trying to promote international law. I think you've put your finger on what is a true crisis, an existential crisis for the United States, certainly in terms of our place in the world and what we've always stood for, the rule of law and promoting the sense of human rights and liberty for people everywhere. That's what we stood for. We were the city on the hill. We don't stand for that anymore. And I appreciate your strong work to try to promote that. As you know, I've been working on the same issue my whole career, and I don't think we've ever been in as bad a place, but I wonder how we got here. 
I think it didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen with Trump's election. John Bolton, who wrote an article saying that international law is a sham, was in the Bush administration. So this is not all of Trump. I think Trump is more a, a culmination of a long, slow decline, certainly in our knowledge of international law in this country. In China, all 600 law faculties require international law. And in this country, no law school does. At lunch yesterday, I heard some of that skepticism that David raised among the faculty at the University of Chicago Law School. So I'm gonna press you a little more in your answer to his question. Yes, we can explain that globalization requires law that is uh, binding on everyone globally, but how would you diagnose where we went wrong in this country 20, 30 years ago so that we've gotten to this point? And how can we turn that around? What will really repair and deepen both the knowledge and the respect for public international law in the United States? Um, so I, I'm glad you asked the question. You know, suppose this is a fork in the road. Um, when you're in academia, um, suppose this is the invasion of Iraq, 2003. You go down this road when you should have gone down this road. And in academia, the question you ask is, where did we go wrong? When you're in the government, the question is, how do we go from where we are, whether it got better or worse, to where we ought to be? You know, what kinds of corrections can we make in an uncharitable political environment, and what corrections should we then make if we have a more charitable political environment? So my view on this is, yes, George Bush was a, a bad administration, and now he looks like he's better than what we have now. And so, you know, he's, in fact, he's reclaimed his reputation. The invasion of Iraq what a, was a catastrophic disaster. Uh, it also ensured failure in Afghanistan, and it also led to the rise of various groups that were continuing this fight when there was a chance at that point to address the ISIS, I'm sorry, the Al Qaeda problem early on, which, which wasn't addressed. But I do believe that given where we are now, the question is how to do damage control from a president who is really a lot worse um, than anything we've ever seen, and then create a check and balance against him. So uh, we were asked a question here about 2020. Uh, 20, uh, 2020. I'm worried about November 6th. You know, if, if the Democrats don't take back one house, there is no check. So every single person, you know, I, I was grateful for Gretchen's request that everybody get out and get out the vote. You know, if you don't vote, you're part of the problem. Um, I would love, and I'm sure David would love this too, I, I would love to not have to watch the news. <laughs> there, there was a time when, when I didn't. I would go a couple days. With, you know, because the world wasn't ending every single second. It's exhausting. <laughs> the burden on human beings and citizens to monitor activity has gone way, way up because the unthinkable happens every six hours or so. I'll give you an example. In the last couple of months, the North Koreans assassinated the brother of their leader on Malaysian soil with chemical agents. The Russians assassinated a Russian guy in Salisbury, England, on a park bench outside a pub with nerve agents. The crown prince of Saudi Arabia, by all indications, sent a hit team to kill a guy who is world known inside a diplomatic consulate. And yesterday, somebody made an assassination attempt against a number of our former presidents and a number of people who are designated as political uh, enemies of the president. This is not normal behavior. That shows how things, things have skewed. So our challenge now is to figure out how to get from where we are to something closer to a situation of normal politics. And then once we're in that state, we still have to figure out how to move from where we are up here back down to where we ought to be. And one way to do it is to make sure that the entire order that was created post-World War II is not dismantled in the process. 
I use the analogy of Muhammad Ali advisedly because he won the fight, but he came unglued. I think we can survive two years. I don't think we could survive, I think we could survive four years. I don't think we could survive eight years of this. I think at that point, um, it, it will be a permanently dislocating event. And that's what makes this moment so important because the opportunity to start the pendulum swinging back is uh, on November 6th. Um. My name is Andrew Simon. I'm a first year in the college. Um, a lot of conservatives today feel that accepting and following international law makes the United States weaker as a country. Um, and for that reason, I think there's a lot of angst and a lack of support for following international law on the right side of the country. Um, why do you feel that that is like, not a correct opinion? Or do you think that that opinion can be remedied and um, we can get all people of the United States to support international law? So, so let me ask you, do you think the United States was on the right side of international law in World War II? I'm not an expert, uh, but for the most part, I think yes. I mean, c combating aggression and, and dealing with people who are committing genocide. Yeah. And, and do you think that the fact that international law was on our side made it more possible to mobilize the kind of coalition that was needed for that sustained war effort? I do. Well, you know, same thing now. Uh, there's no difference. L let me just give one very simple example. The Law of the Sea Treaty. You know, the United States helped to draft it. In 1982, we didn't join it. And we didn't join the dispute resolution mechanisms. And every Secretary of Defense, every Secretary of uh, the Navy, every Secretary of State, every National Security Advisor except for John Bolton has said that we should join. And the people who are keeping us out are keep, keeping us out in the name of sovereignty. What's the result? The Russians have much more sway in the Arctic because we cannot use, we can't invoke the Law of the Sea Treaty as a tool. The Chinese have much more sway in the South China Sea. I mean, these are the people that they hate the most, the Russians and the Chinese. And in the name of sovereignty, they are jeopardizing our capacity to respond. That's a classic and obvious area where international law makes us stronger. You know, Trump wants to get out of the WTO. We have complaints against China in the WTO. And it's precisely uh, the WTO which gives a vehicle for you know, peaceful dispute resolution on these issues. Can we have time for one more question? Two more questions. <clears throat> Professor Coe, um, Brian Casey, I'm an attorney in Indiana, a uh, student of yours back in the day. Um, you, you said that uh, 2012 in uh, Syria was, uh, was perhaps a, 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 a time that you know, was not the, the State Department's you know, finest hour in terms of decision making. Looking back as an academic... Uh, I didn't say the State Department. I said the administration. Okay, the administration. Right. <laughs> I think uh, the State Department was on the right side of it, but they weren't winning. Okay, well, could, could you go into uh, a, a little more detail as to, you know, in 2012, what could have been done differently, um, particularly given, you know, the, 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 the Congress that, that was had at the time, uh, you know, our, you know the, the number of years in Afghanistan and Iraq, and then uh, prescriptively, you know, 2018, what, if anything, can be done about Syria now? Um, so there are a lot more options in 2012 than there are now. Um, you know, back then, um, you know, I, I have huge respect for President Obama. What he did, though, was he said Assad must go and created no mechanism for Assad to go. And um, the question was going to be, how do you get to a peace process? Now, any UN resolution was being vetoed by the Russians. Starting in about two, 2011, they started vetoing everything, and it's been 12 consecutive vetoes. You know, when we were in school, the Russian veto was a very familiar thing, and it stopped around 1987, and it resumed around 2010. My view was there was an occasion at that point for a diplomatic process that could have been mobilized by the process of setting up you know, humanitarian safe zones for refugees, things that would prevent them from leaving the country. 
all kinds of things could have been done during that point. You know, Syrian assets were frozen. They could have tapped those assets. Um, they could have gotten to the root causes. They could have entered into a burden-sharing agreement on the refugee side with uh, a number of European nations so that Turkey and Jordan didn't bear the burden. Um, they probably would have ended up discussing some kind of partition of the country. But one of the prerequisites would have been that Assad goes. I mean, after all, in Dayton, one of the prerequisites was that um, those people who had committed gross violations and war crimes uh, you know, couldn't be permanent leaders of the process that existed after the fact. And both Milosevic and Radovan Karadzic ended up before the war crimes tribunal. They could have set up an accountability process. Anyway, none of those things happened. And I think what happened was, you know, President Obama was limping along with a bare legislative majority. When he announced the red line in 2013, he didn't have support from either Congress or our allies. And then he backed off of it. And I think that was a fatal moment all around the world in terms of our Syria policy. Now, if you, if you look, people like um, Samantha Power, John Kerry, Hillary Clinton all objected to that. Um, that was a moment for engaged diplomacy, which we didn't take up. Um, and what actually, though, did happen was when the force was threatened, they started a process where the Russians persuaded the Syrians to give up a big chunk of their chemical weapons. But they kept caches behind. And now they've used them again. Now, you know, I had polio as a boy. I don't want to see polio return. I really don't. And I, chemical weapons were banned. I, I really don't want to see them return. But we are certainly in an awkward place if we're speaking out about the use of chemical weapons against civilians and we haven't done anything about barrel bombs against civilians. Now we have a much more constrained diplomatic environment, but diplomacy is, would still be possible if we had people who are prepared to engage that diplomacy. You know, the Russians have consented to something called the Astana process, which is sort of limping along. But the envoy, Stefan de Mistura, just quit. He's the third one. You know, Kofi Annan quit as, as uh, envoy. So you don't have anybody to kind of monitor the process. And for this to work, you need all of the countries who are affected to agree that that's the place that they're going to meet. And you know, Donald Trump goes to the UN and they, they laugh at him. Um, so he's not going to be able to mobilize people. He just lost his UN ambassador. So that's a very sad state of affairs. Uh, one thing you'll notice on the cover of my book, when, <laughs> when they sent me the cover of the book, the proposed cover, they had a big picture of Donald Trump, huge picture of Donald Trump. And I said, you know, I, I really don't want to look at this for the rest of my life. <laughs> And then they said, what would you prefer instead? And I said, how about, you know, The Wizard of Oz? You know, a, a little man on television screens talking to people who aren't really listening to him. And so they said, oh, we got the perfect picture. And it's a picture of him giving a speech to the UN General Assembly. So that's, that's what's there. <laughs> and then, of course, they have the words, international law bigger than Donald Trump, which is my theme. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Good to see you. Uh, thank you both for your time. My name is Monica Wiseman. I'm a 2L at the law school here, and I'm currently inv involved in uh, some clinic work involving uh, Guantanamo Bay. Good for you. And I you. was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, so, I mean, assuming, hopefully, that we have an administration in the future that uh, is not, does not have so much contempt for international law and is more willing to engage internationally, um, even if we have such an administration again, uh, how, how do you see Guantanamo Bay playing out? Um, how, how can we credibly um, engage internationally with that stain? And do you, how do you see Guantanamo Bay detention camp being resolved, if, if at all? So I've been to Guantanamo 19 times. And I first went in 1991 for Haitian refugees. I went for Cuban refugees. Uh, I went multiple times. One of the things in the book, I think Donald Trump can close Guantanamo. I think he should close Guantanamo. 
there are only 41 people there. It's the smallest number we've ever had. You know, Obama should have closed Guantanamo. That's another failure. Um, but you know, by the way, if, if Trump's only real strategic um, driver is doing something Obama couldn't do, I got one. Close Guantanamo. <laughs> Close Guantanamo. You know, you want liberals to cheer? You know, I'm cheering. <laughs> now, why is that possible? Because the first guy they captured, he was going to bring him to Guantanamo. In fact, people like Lindsey Graham were encouraging him to do so. And then they pointed out that military commissions have gotten almost no convictions, and that people who are at Guantanamo are being held at the cost of $11 million a year. And Trump actually, this is the most cogent tweet I've ever seen. He says something like, not sending him to Guantanamo because he can get prosecuted faster in New York and much cheaper. Now, if he didn't send that guy, why don't they work out a deal? Now, by the way, he would get a lot of goodwill with nations who don't have much uh, positive feeling about him by doing that. And um, it, again, takes this as kind of a priority. Now, I think they want to leave the notion that Guantanamo is available for the worst of the worst. But you, know, you don't leave Guantanamo. We're going to be in a situation pretty soon where people on Guantanamo will start dying of old age. And by the way, having been to Guantanamo, they don't have medical facilities for gerontology. Are, are we going to let them die on Guantanamo? How will that look? And if we're going to bring in the United States to have medical treatment, then why not bring them now? Um, now, if Trump, this is a Nixon to China thing. If Trump called Lindsey Graham, who, as you know, is eager to please Trump these days, and say, I want you to lead the effort to let me close Guantanamo, I think we could close Guantanamo in a year. And you know, I, I, I read an op-ed praising Trump. <laughs> so you know, my view is uh, it's possible. It, it, it should be possible. I, I worked on Guantanamo, my wife pointed out to me, for 19 out of 21 consecutive birthdays. And I don't want to work on it anymore. It really, it really is just uh, every time someone encounters it for the first time, they think it's a solution. And two or three years later, they realize it's nothing but problems. Uh, we should just close it and give it back to the Cubans if we had relations with the Cubans. <laughs> you know, it was, it was right there. Obama you know, developed this kind of diplomatic detente with Cuba, and that was a possible outcome at that point. Guantanamo is only known for things like Guantanamera or a few good men. Uh, we don't need it. Thank you all very much for coming, and Harold, thank you very much. <laughs>